biggest asset we've sold on the platform was sold for $35 million. $35 million, that's a lot of money. Next up on Transformative Purpose, Blake Hutchison, CEO of Flippa. We are the number one marketplace globally to buy and sell online businesses. Representative of entrepreneurs and buyers from over 193 countries. We do over 12,000 transactions a year. Where should people invest themselves? I think that data science is obviously critical. How they can fast track or outpace competition. Don't forget, sales solves everything. What is the minimum ticket size to get into the market? Do you help people finance? What if people don't have that capital uh, ready? How does that look for those people? The minimum buy-in, I would say, is probably $5,000 for you to get yourself an asset which is reliably going to generate what it says on the packet. Best-selling author, award-winning podcast, Transformative Purpose. Hi everyone, welcome back to the new episode on Transformative Purpose, where we learn about how we could grow and become better at what we do. In our conversation today, Blake will share with us what is Flipper, who is it for, his journey in building Flipper and his community, some trends, opportunities, and insights about online businesses and different industries that he sees, as well as insights for entrepreneurs who want to build, scale their businesses, and even increase their company valuation and eventually exit. And for investors, Blake will also cover investment opportunities and some lessons learned that he has learned along the way. So Blake, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Aaron. It's great to be here. Appreciate it. Should we kick off our conversation by a short introduction about who you are and who is Flipper for the audience? Yeah, thank you. Look, as you said, Aaron, and thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, my name's Blake. I'm the CEO here at Flipper. Uh, we are the number one marketplace globally to buy and sell online businesses. We represent entrepreneurs. Those entrepreneurs have built good quality digital cash flow generating businesses. They're looking to sell or exit those. We also represent a network of buyers from all over the world, uh, individuals as well as company and institutional buyers. And as you would expect, those buyers are looking to acquire uh, and or invest in a online business for a number of different reasons. And so the marketplace is representative of entrepreneurs and buyers from over 193 countries. Uh, we do over 12,000 transactions a year and we represent business owners of all sizes from small thousands of dollars in asset value up to big biggest asset we've sold on the platform was sold for $35 million. So 35 million, that's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, it's a good story, that one. So uh, just so it gives people a sense and a glimpse of to what can actually be sold. So as we all know, we're walking around with these smartphones and our smartphones have apps. And those apps represent hundreds of billions of dollars in quarterly revenue for both Android, which is obviously part of the Google ecosystem, as well as iOS, which is obviously Apple. And so you've got these app developers and publishers from all over the world. They build things of value that we all use as everyday consumers, as well as, as businesses. The app owner themselves was based in Singapore and using Flipper's matching engine, they were able to connect with a buyer out of Boston. And that Boston was an aggregator of apps. So their entire livelihood is built around buying the best quality apps around the world and aggregating those and, and benefiting from cost efficiency and optimization. So you've got a Singapore app developer meeting a Boston based investor on a platform and doing a deal, which is pretty cool. Mm. And how long did that deal take? Yeah, because of the size of the deal, you can imagine it took quite a long time. Ultimately, finding the buyer took us around six months. And you're looking for a very specific buyer, someone who could obviously afford a $35 million app. And of course, you know, the app itself was in the small business utility space. So it was something you're looking for a very specific buyer for. Um, by the time, you know, funds have been received and released to the app developer's account, you're talking around nine months. Mm, right, okay, about six to nine months. I'm gonna get into the specifics about Flipper and some, you know, try to pick your brain on some of your insights about the markets that you're seeing in a bit. But I sort of want to understand a bit more about your leadership journey. Like you've been sure. the CEO for the last, what, four or five years, right? Four. Yes. How did you get there? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a really important piece. I mean, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, one, I've got a history of working for founders in, in different organizations. And so that's, I guess, relatively unique in the sense that there's probably very few people who have spent a career doing and executing what a founder intends to execute or what a founder's vision might be. And then secondly, I've worked across multiple different industries in various different roles. So I've got a, a kind of 360 degree view or holistic understanding of different business models and how they work. Uh, Flip is obviously a marketplace. Um, I've built a marketplace myself. 
um, albeit not a very successful one, but regardless, you sort of learn the ins and outs of marketplace dynamics and how they work and what's important in the growth journey for a marketplace. And then from a leadership standpoint, you know, that was really a function of building leadership experiences into my resume over, a, I guess, a, a 20 year career. So um, it tends to be that, you know, I'm, I'm quite decisive in my decision making. People tend to like that. It gives them clear direction. It gives them a goal. Um, it means that you can actually aspire to achieve short term results. People tend to like that from leaders. Um, it also means that I can point to lots of stories of things that have gone right or wrong. And again, it gives your, your team's perspective um, around the decisions they make and people tend to like that. Um, so I suppose, you know, the short story is that over a 20 year journey, it's the combination of getting diverse experiences from other good leaders, getting diverse experiences across different industries, and then getting diverse experiences across other business models. And often what I find is people who I interview or, or other leaders, they can sometimes, not always of course, be a little bit narrow-minded by their lack of access to other industries, categories, business models or contexts. But you know, having worked across the globe, across, as I said, different industries and business models, you tend to have quite a, a good understanding of how different things work and can make decisions accordingly. So from your narrative, it sounds like you you were more of a generalist, at least in the beginning, and you got that sort of holistic view of different industries and working with different types of leaders. What would be your advice for the young people, right? Should they, with ChatGPT, all this generative AI technologies coming out, should we still aim to become a specialist in a certain field? Or should we try to be like you, be more like a generalist early on in the career? What's your thought? Yeah, you know, I think specialization is important, um, but I also think that you should test your limits and evolve uh, your skill set across different specialisations. So at any given time, I don't think it's worthwhile being a generalist, but over a long period of time, I think that you should develop different skills. So let's say for argument's sake, you are an SEO specialist. Well, that's a very highly sought after skill set. And so I'd encourage people to double down on that skill set because they're highly employable, um, it's the type of skill that, you know, uh, outside of potential disruption from maybe AI, um, is likely to be long sought after. And so you get benefits from that specialization. Uh, but let's say for argument's sake, you wanted to move into a growth marketing role. Well, outside of your SEO specialization, then it would be worthwhile thinking about other areas of the growth marketing discipline where you might be weaker. And therefore, uh, tap into some of those skills. So is that affiliate market? Um, is that life cycle? Market? Um, is that uh, paid and performance marketing by, by way of you know, Google, Facebook, TikTok, Pinterest, or wherever else you might pay to acquire a customer? So I think that my short answer to it is definitely specialize. And then throughout your career, pick and choose moments where you diverse into, uh, diversify your skill set. Mm. Very, very relevant, I think, for, for a lot of young people these days with a lot of dis disruption coming through from, from the tech space. From where you sit, what skills are hot at the moment? Where should people invest themselves? You touch on, you know, SEO space and the different lifecycle marketing skills. Yeah, I mean, I think the obvious one is, and you've already alluded to it, we're maybe five minutes into our chat, and I think we've mentioned the generative AI and uh, machine learning a couple of times. So, so let's go there. I think that data science um, is is obviously critical for businesses making growth decisions and, um, and thinking about how they can fast track or, or or outpace competition. So data science is relative dis a, a very relevant discipline in this day and age, and will be for the next couple of decades, no doubt about that. I think that don't forget sales solves everything. So. If data science isn't your thing, but perhaps you're a very, very strong relationship person or you've got a, the gift of the gab, um, you're strong commercially, uh, I think that sales as a profession is still underappreciated, particularly in some markets. I think the Americans very much appreciate sales and pay really well for people who are strong sales professionals. 
but other markets like Australia, it's probably less well respected um, and less sought after, which is unfortunate. So I think that Flipper's challenges, I'm looking for people who are good with data and can help us out with machine learning models. So data scientists, and I'm looking for people who can sell. Um, you know, the rest is kind of dime a dozen. Um, with, with all due respect, there's plenty of accountants, there's plenty of lawyers. Um, it's hard to differentiate in that space. But I think if you've got a skill set which helps dynamic businesses grow in a very competitive environment, I would say, therefore, you know, I'm thinking about growth marketers, uh, I'm thinking about life cycle marketers, I'm thinking about sales people generally, uh, and I'm thinking about data scientists. They're, they would be careers where I think you'd be well placed to land not only a really fulfilling long term career, but frankly, they pay well. Thank you. Reflecting on your 20 year journey, you mentioned you had some ups and downs, you know, you, you've had some successes, you made some mistakes, right? Um, let's just put the successes aside, right? I'm keen to learn from you. If you were to do it again, right? Is there something you would do differently? So I really like all of the learning experiences I've had and you learn more from your failures than you do your successes. So, so they sucked at the time, but the reality is probably a better person for them, be it perhaps a little more humble or be it you know, more, more erstwhile in your decision making. So I wouldn't take back any of the mistakes I've made, albeit right then and there in the moment, um, I certainly didn't want to be necessarily going through them. So. You know, perhaps the biggest mistake, albeit incredible learning, was the, the six years uh, running what ultimately was a failed endeavour. You learn a lot from that, you go through some very trying times, both, you know, emotionally, uh, but also financially. So that's, that's difficult, uh, but no doubt the way I can operate today is in some part a function of that six year experience. Any advice, hacks, tactics that you use? You mentioned that you were in this, there were a lot of emotions and it did feel suck, you know, when you're sort of in, in that space. How do you get yourself back up? Like, how do you problem solve when you're not functioning 100%? What do you do with your mindset? Do you exercise? You know, what are your daily hacks? How does your day look like? Yeah, so part of it for me is uh, learning in very, very short periods of time. Um, because if learning takes too long, it can actually really impact your energy levels and it can confuse you as to what the eventual outcome will look like. And so what I've always tried to do is break down challenges into very, very short periods of time. So let's say for argument's sake, you have two customers today. Um, the challenge next week is to have four. Not 40, not 400, not 4,000, but four. And so if you break that down, you will probably then look at how you acquired your first two customers. You may even speak to those first two customers and ask them what they think about your product, whether they like it or not. And so you're breaking things down into micro tactics. You're executing against those, and then you're reflecting on the learnings. And so that's always been a good way for me to get out of a rut, because it's pretty easy to achieve something in such a short period of time. And it's actually really difficult to achieve something over a longer period of time. You may get there, but the sequence of events is often rocky and a bit roller coaster like. Mm. So short period, short windows help for getting out of ruts. In, in certainly, um, if you're talking about more generally, you know, what are the skills that I would apply uh, to getting through those difficult times? You know, they're the obvious ones, right? Sleep well, exercise a lot, um, do the things that sort of trick your body into feeling good about itself. And um, it tends to be that. If you can do that, the next day is a little bit easier to get through it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So always look after your body first before you care for others, right? <laughs> yeah, although, you know, my wife would tell you if she was on this interview that I don't do very, very well at that. So it's one thing providing the advice. It's another thing executing on it. Yeah, <laughs> do what we preach. Isn't that one uh, challenge for all of us? Sleeping well and exercising a lot. How many hours do you sleep a day on average? How often do you exercise? <laughs> uh, I would say sleep, yeah. Um, not a lot, five hours. I'm mean, an exercise I'm pretty good at in the sense that um, I go for a walk every every night uh, with my dog for about 30 minutes. That's that's good, that's that's a good little mental release. Um, try to play golf once a week, so that's 
very That's good nice. for, for the bind body and soul and also for a bit of socialization and then um, you know when the knees and legs are feeling okay i'll go for a couple of runs a week oh nice nice well thank you so much for sharing i guess your you know your challenges in the past you know how you look at skills building and i guess you know some tips for i guess looking after ourselves our, our mental health and our physical health so let's shift gear and talk about flipper i read in your recent post that you guys have done a series of road shows yeah right matching you know venture capitalists investors entrepreneurs and people thinking about starting their own businesses right and you also mentioned about a very successful newsletter so just wanted to learn from you how did you build your online community and what did you learn along the way yeah so i think there's a couple of things right flipper is what you might call a high value low repeat marketplace and so it's a little bit analogous to real estate so you're talking about high transaction values uh, very emotional purchase very emotional sale and as a function of that a traditional sales and marketing approach certainly works but is better when complemented by in-person experiences and or trust building events and so Flipper's been blessed with a very, very big community having been born out of uh, a developer environment called SidePoint. And so over many, many years, we've amassed, uh, in fact, I think next week, we will tick over our four millionth user. And so in having that size and that substantial size community, uh, we thought that what we would do is take our story on the road and and treat the flipper marketing exercise as a more traditional one, where it's about building credibility in who we are, as well as allowing the network to learn from each other and enabling those success stories to incubate. The good thing about those in-person events is they actually become fantastic content marketing mm. assets in their own right. Because every time you host an event, you get to take photographs. Every time you host an event, you get to speak and therefore tell your story. You can then capture that on film and redistribute that. Every time you have an event, you can capture the, the, the emotional reaction that your community has to you, um, shoot short interviews, and use those as part of other marketing channels like your life cycle marketing efforts. So they have a great deal of benefit um, far in excess of just using them as in the moment sales opportunities. Of course, what we're able to do is use IP address, use the registered location of any given individual and then tap into those individuals where they are when those events happen. Um, and we love partnerships here because we've got a big ecosystem within the tech community. And so we were able to do that with a NASDAQ listed partner, SEMrush, which is a marketing analytics software for entrepreneurs. Uh, so I, I would suggest to, to, to any um, business owner, if you can, if you can congregate um, people, uh, you will learn a lot from those people. And it actually is a lot easier to sell your story when you are um, less likely to succumb to distractions mm -hmm. like web browsing or a text message oh, yeah. hitting your mobile phone or anything else. As it relates to the newsletter, before we had our AI matching and other keyword-based matching tools that we've employed for some time now, um, we didn't really communicate with our customers outside of them organically hitting the website or creating an alert. <coughs> Excuse me. The problem with an alert is it's very specific and it implies the buyer themselves knows what they're looking for. And so the newsletter sounds very obvious um, and it is very obvious, but it's our way of showcasing the best deals available on Flipper at any given time and driving uh, some competitiveness and some competitive tension for those deals uh, by bringing more buyers onto the platform more often. And uh, it's, uh, it's still today one of our most effective uh, marketing mediums. So we have over 600,000 subscribers to what we call The Daily, 
and the daily is simply a, a curated list of deals. And uh, as a function of the quality of those deals and as a function of the size of the community, there's great deal of word of mouth, great deal of uh, virality to that marketing approach. Um, and it's really efficient for us. Um, we don't measure it by open rates and click rates, which mm -hmm. is traditional marketing. Um, we measure it by transaction value um, because in theory, you could have one person open that email from the 600,000 on your list. If they ultimately end up buying a million dollar asset, uh, well, clearly the open rate's been low, but the email has been effective. So we, um, we obviously look at, you know, traditional metrics, uh, but we measure it through a way of uh, revenue. Mm. This is where you tr you sort of drew comparison uh, to a real estate business, right? Where you have high value and low repeat uh, sort of operating operating model. Very impressive numbers, I've got to say, six hundred thousand um, subscribers on your email, and you got four million users on your platform. How did you get from zero to four million, or from zero to six hundred? I think that's a question that a lot of people want to find out. <laughs> yeah, so the zero to one piece. Um, it is a function of being born out of a developer community. So marketplaces are really hard, right? Um, and you've probably heard the phrase, the cold start problem before. And so which side of the marketplace do you invest in? Flipper was benefited by some smart founders that had a developer community. The developer community was trading. Uh, that was all happening quite organically. And as a function of that, they then spun out Flipper as a standalone marketplace and were able to leverage that existing community. So that's zero to one. And then you get one to kind of 10. And that's when network effects start to play out, right? Um, where you get any given, any, any successful buyer will tend to add other buyers. Any successful seller will tend to add other, other, other sellers. The quality of the assets you bring to the platform by nature of them and what people are interested in will bring new buyers to the platform. The quality of the buyers you have on the platform attracts more entrepreneurs who want to sell. Um, so over time, you start to get that network effect playing out. Um, and then um, it's really a function of how you expand above and beyond that. So for Flipper, it was a function of moving up the value chain. We knew that we had a very, very strong community of buyers who were looking for assets, maybe sub $100,000, um, and a very strong community of entrepreneurs who owned assets uh, valued up to $100,000. So then it was a function of, well, can you leverage that community to go after a bigger prize, a higher value asset. That's a function of more traditional marketing means, Aaron. That's a function of um, uh, non-brand uh, performance marketing. Um, it's a function of understanding what businesses you've represented today and what businesses are like those businesses, but perhaps are bigger, and then using those success stories of the past to attract those probable success stories of the future. And then of course, some virality um, in all of that. And then of course, there's the long-term thesis, which we're investing in big time, which is that there'll be more digital assets in the next five, 10, and 20 years than there are today. And there'll be more people interested in it as a genuine asset class in the next two, five, 10 years than there are today. And so you're really leveraging what is a really large target addressable market um, and picking and choosing where those customers are. The only other thing I would add to that is you know, clearly Flipper represents sites, stores, and apps. Well, you can imagine that if you represent sites and stores, then there's a natural growth trajectory through the launch of apps. And so the digital asset universe and community um, is, and I say this in the most polite way, um, it's incestuous by nature, right? So if someone runs a good quality blog, there's a high chance that they probably know other good quality bloggers. There's also an equally high chance that they know other people digital economy and so if you've got a big enough community uh, the launch of new categories and asset types will tend to attract a new and similar audience um, and that's a good growth vehicle and lever that we have um, often used mm. and just before our conversation you talked about people could actually look at flipper as a potential passive income um, channel as well can you talk a little bit about that yeah, so I'm going to be really careful with the term passive because um, there's kind of no such uh, digital asset, but let's talk about near passive. So let's use some numbers. Uh, let's say for argument's sake that I uh, 
buy a blog for fifty thousand dollars for simple math you could imagine that blog trading for two times its earnings so if i acquired it for fifty thousand dollars these are obviously very very approximate numbers it may be doing approximately twenty five thousand dollars in earnings okay so i pay fifty thousand dollars for the asset and the next year so long as i can operate that business to the same levels as the prior owner I make $25,000. Well, that's a 50% annualized return on my investment in year one. Mm -hmm. There's very few asset classes in the world that are not speculative. Forget about NFT, fads, Mm -hmm. crypto fads, um, that are not speculative, which will Mm -hmm. give you that level of yield. So in year two, I've paid off my asset. In year three, I have a very, very strong cash flow generating asset which has paid for itself and is now supplementing my lifestyle my income my other investments my costs of living and that is a very common flipper play Um, and that's no different for institutional and company buyers actually they treat it as a way to add revenue to an existing portfolio or add revenue to an existing strategy or acquire new users for an existing asset. So people are supplementing their income and in some cases, Aaron, they're actually replacing their income. They actually become acquisition entrepreneurs where they quit the nine to five, they deploy a certain amount of money. Um, the return for that is an asset. That asset is cash flow generating. Uh, they are now entrepreneurs and instead of going from um, zero to one, or at least attempting it, and actually taking a gamble that we know more often than not loses. Right? Most businesses do not survive five years. Mm-hmm. That that's a fact, right? Less than ten percent of businesses survive to the five year mark. So you're actually starting something, knowing full well mm-hmm. that you have a ninety five percent likelihood of failing. That is, I played that game. It's a very <laughs> odd game. That's a very odd game to play, yeah. uh, knowing that the odds are against you. Whereas if you buy something that is already five years old, that is already generating income, mm. uh, the odds of it falling over are pretty slim. Yeah. And that's such a, such a compelling point. And there's so many, I have to agree with you there, with the failure rate with new businesses, and, and yet there's so many get-rich-quick, Go and be an entrepreneur, quit your nine to five advisors out there, which I feel are not very responsible and they're not really painting the, the right reality um, for a lot of people out there. I want to ask you, uh, so the, the example that you gave was a 50,000 blog, but what is the minimum ticket size to get into the market? Do you help people finance? What if people don't have that capital uh, ready? How, how does that look for those people? Yeah, so I think if you're looking for a revenue generating asset, and that's what we're talking about today, um, the minimum buy-in, I would say, is probably $5,000 for you to get yourself an asset which uh, is is reliably going to generate what it says on the packet. Um, You can buy less expensive assets, but you're really just buying a a template or a starter site. So $5,000 would be your minimum buy-in. Here at Flipper, our average transaction value is $40,000. And obviously we sell assets for 10 and $20 million. It really is though something that you can build up to. So back in March 19, a gentleman in Serbia bought his first asset on Flipper for $600. Since that time, he has acquired 244 assets Wow. And his most recent purchase was $101,000. So to today, he has spent $819,000 on the platform. And he is up five times on his invested dollar. So that's an example of someone who started small. And you're essentially promoting yourself. So here, you know, in a uh, nine to five corporate setting, you have to plead to your boss, you know, I've done a great job, please pay me, please pay me more money. That Serbian DJ has essentially promoted himself um, every couple of months, essentially. He went from 
six hundred thousand dollar six hundred dollar acquisition to a thousand dollar acquisition, two thousand dollar acquisition, five thousand dollar acquisition. Each time he does that, he's adding revenue to his portfolio. That's the critical piece here. And as a function of adding revenue to his portfolio, he's able to also drive efficiencies within the portfolio based on his learnings from the other assets that he's already acquired. And so you take the learnings of what you do each day and you apply them to what you're going to do tomorrow. And as a function of that, he has been able to promote himself through the platform. And so it's an important point. If you've got $10,000 to spend, it may not actually be a good idea to buy one asset. It may be a good idea to buy three. Start with one, optimize that, reinvest the dollars into asset number two and then do so again. So you're spreading the value of that 10,000 over three investments. And you know, if you go and look at the world's leading investors, very few of them will put all their eggs in one basket. Mm-hmm. And I guess for, for people who are interested in you know buying a business on your platform, right? So when they, what happens after they acquire it? Do they just acquire the platform and the customer's details and they need to take over the, the operation? What happens to the, you know, what happens to the operating team that was attached to, to the former business? Yeah, so typically for a smaller asset, um, there's a transfer period and a handover period. When that handover period expires, so let's say for argument's sake that um, I agree to buy your business, Aaron, um, I might say, look, Aaron, you obviously know a lot about the business. You've been doing this for five years. I'd like you to stay on board for 90 days so that I can actually understand the day-to-day, day-to-day operations. And that's all a part of the agreement. After that point in time, I'm now the operator. Now, we're living in 2023. I could then go and hire VAs and other specialists um, on platforms like Upwork or Fiverr who can essentially take over 99% of the operations. But yes, I am the general manager. I am the CEO. I run that business. The decision making uh, is mine to to contemplate. Uh, but the operations, you can obviously distribute that load among you know, freelancers, VAs, and other resources you can get a hold of. Now, if it's a bigger sale, or at half a million dollars, a million dollars, up to ten and fifty million dollars, typically uh, the buyer will acquire the employees, in some cases the, the original owner, uh, to stay on board for a more traditional uh, earnout period. But if you're talking about sub 100K, it's relatively straightforward. There's a handover period and ultimately you are the operator. Mm. Mm. And yes, you get to, to your point about the assets, you, it's, it's all subject to negotiation, but, it, but in short, you're buying 100% of the assets. So you're buying the domain, you're buying the storefront. Let's let's assume it's a Shopify store. Um, you're buying the domain. You're buying the storefront and the store account ownership. Um, you're buying the customer database. You're obviously buying um, all the IP. Uh, in many cases, you're acquiring the inventory. Uh, and so anything that you can imagine, you're buying the standard operating procedures. You're buying the manufacturing relationships. You're buying the wholesale agreements if they exist. Um, you're buying the agreements you might have with the logistics providers. So it's, it is literally a business sale. You, everything that goes into that business to run it day to day, you are acquiring. Some assets are more simple than others. If you take a mm. WordPress blog, mm. um, you know, you're essentially acquiring the WordPress account. The WordPress mm. account gives you the keys to the castle. From there, um, it's a matter of deriving revenue and that will often be Google AdSense, in which case, drop the Google ads and pixel on and away you go. I was going to ask you a follow-up question because you have such a database, such a big database, 4 million users, uh, 600,000 subscribers on your newsletter and you know a series of roadshows that you've done quite recently. Where are the opportunities? Where are the trends in terms of industry and asset types? Because you know, when I look through your website, um, I think your recent, your recent roadshow covered 15 different different cities and you spoke to 2,344 business owners and investors, right? So where are the opportunities? Where do you see the market, you know, in terms of asset types and also in terms of industries? Yeah, so I think the app ecosystem is a really good one, right? So you've got uh, the iOS and Android ecosystem and most of us are familiar with that because we carry our computers in our pocket. Um, but in addition to that, there is a broader app ecosystem. So Shopify plugins, Salesforce plugins, WordPress plugins, these are all considered apps. And the app ecosystem is 
is thriving right now as these platforms rely on these ecosystems to power their customer bases. Each one of those is an individual business. Each one of those is tying into the platform economy and each one of those um, has kind of an inextricable connection to whatever the needs are of a business owner utilising that platform. So they're a good play and it's a fast growth play and therefore so there's, there's lots of investors interested in acquiring those assets where they've got maturity and, and sustainability to that. So that would be one. Um, the other, Aaron, is similar to what you're doing right now, right? Um, community-based platforms. So uh, podcasts, uh, YouTube channels, uh, Facebook groups, these types of things where people have worked hard to amass audiences, um, investors and acquirers are certainly interested. So it really is a function of traditional economics which drive the behaviours of these investors looking for digital assets. How good is the revenue? And when I say good, it's about not only can you generate the revenue, but is it sustainable revenue? And then secondly, how big is the audience and how repetitive is the audience's use of that service? Those two factors um, can apply to give you applied against almost every, any business, but also certainly any digital asset or online business. So Flipper is kind of built on top of the platform economy. And of course, most entrepreneurs today are built on top of the platform economy. So anything where you can imagine Google, Amazon, Shopify, Stripe, PayPal, Wix, WooCommerce, Substack, YouTube, anything where you can imagine those platforms um, existing into the future uh, means that you know there's, there's no doubt an online business owner behind it, but there's also a, an interested investor. As it relates to categories, buyers in this space uh, aren't looking for fads um, or speculative assets. <clears throat> so it's really interesting. People often say to us, wow, have you got all these people buying AI assets right now? Yes, we do, but people are, investors are far more likely um, to invest in boring traditional industries. So people look for travel-based assets. People look for assets that are in the finance industry. People look for assets that are in the fashion industry the pets industry, the home industry, the health and wellness industry. Um, these traditional industries are online too. And a digital asset owner who is, has built something of scale in a traditional industry has something which is um, infinitely more valuable to an investor in the space than something which is a bit new and faddish. So, you know, ultimately, the average age of a business that sells on Flipper is four and a half years old. Mm. And so what you're looking for is sustainability and repeatability. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, we don't have buyers who are snapping up AI-based assets right now. Of course they are. You know, we sold a, um, it was a, a newsletter creator, AI-based newsletter creator. It was only around for six months. It sold for $140,000. Um, so that's cool. But, you know, we sell 12,000 assets a year. So... Most of them are more traditional industries where buyers have confidence that it's predictable and repeatable. Mm. I like how you drew that comparison between speculative assets and more traditional stable assets. And you can almost tell with that four and a half year lifespan of the business, they can't be speculative, right? And for people, I think I feel like they're throwing money into speculative assets. You really need to have that capital that you can play with in order to do that. So, so just on that, quickly, Aaron, age, age for a digital asset is like location in traditional real estate. Um, if you buy in a blue chip neighborhood or suburb, if it's been blue chip for 20 years, it's likely to be blue chip for the next 20 years. Best suburbs have been the best suburbs for a very long time. And regardless of gentrification, the best suburbs are still the best suburbs. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, each in digital asset land is a bit similar. If you've been around for five years, and two years running, you've done $100,000 revenue, save for a pandemic or macroeconomic catastrophe. It's highly likely that that business will survive into the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth year. And it's highly likely that if it's been consistently generating revenue and that revenue has been stable and repeatable for the last three years, it's also highly likely it will continue that way. Mm. So how should we, how, 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 how would you generally advise people how to allocate their capital 
like towards speculative assets and sort of more stable assets on your platform. So let's say someone has $10,000 to spend, right? Should they go all, all in $10,000 just on a stable asset or two thirds of that should go towards a stable asset and one on speculative asset? I don't think anyone but rich people should be doing anything that's speculative. Um, if you've got $10,000 and that's what you're sitting on for the purpose of an investment and you have no idea how an online business works, do not spend it with us. <laughs> um, if you've got $10,000 to spend on an investment and you have a very good sense of how online business works, perhaps you were a writer for a e-commerce business, perhaps you were working in SEO, perhaps you were doing merchandise, perhaps you um, have been in growth marketing. If you have a skill set that can be applied to an online business, you have $10,000 to spend, I think that's a really, really safe bet. Um, but as I said, if you've got $10,000 and you know absolutely nothing about online businesses, um, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, if you've got $100,000, and uh, you know nothing, then yeah, I think you can uh, you can hedge your bets a little bit, and you can make more traditional investments by way of stocks and bonds, obviously real estate, um, and you can put some of that aside um, to buy into your first digital asset online business because in reality, the skill sets um, are easily easy to come by. Again, we were talking about someone who has $100,000 to invest versus $10,000 to invest, where you can spread that risk. Um, you know, if I think about a tr typical and traditional buyer on Flipper who's buying something in excess of $250,000, they are prolific operators. Mm. Um, you know, we have people who buy two, three, five, and 10 of those per annum. Um, and they, you know, they clearly understand what they're doing uh, and therefore, you know, it's it's less wise to go head to head with them. Um, but at the same time, you know, you can start small. We told the story before on the Serbian DJ started with six hundred dollars. That's uh, amazing. So start small, build your knowledge, build your capability, learn, and learn with a with a budget that you can take a risk on. Yeah. I want to ask you a question about hunting for a good deal. What are the qualities? What are the signals? As you mentioned about that block trading, you know, two times it's earning, right? Is that a good deal? Like, how do you quantify that? Yeah, so a lot of it comes down to the metrics that matter for any given business model. And so when you're hunting a deal, we probably need to first think about the type of deal we're hunting. So let's say for argument's sake, we're hunting for a content asset. So that would typically be a blog, um, but in theory, you could be buying a newsletter, you could be buying a podcast. So let's say it's a content asset. Um, then, like any other asset, the first thing you're looking to understand is its revenue trajectory. So is it flat? Is it declining? Or is it growing? If something is declining, and you've never ever run a turnaround before, do not buy it. If something is declining 10% month on month for the last six months, doesn't matter how good an operator you are, most likely is it will decline 10% 10, 10 the next month as well. Uh, so is it flat? Is it declining? Is it growing? Um, if you're looking at a content asset, you would look at traffic. And so similarly, is the traffic flat? Is it growing? is declining. If the traffic's declining, that means the revenue base will ultimately follow suit. If it's flat or growing, that's a good news story, particularly if it's been flat or growing for some period of time, preferably over a year, because that gives you some sense that you're actually dealing with brand. And Google has in fact decided that this site is worthwhile sending customers to do. So if it's flat or if it's growing, then you'd be looking at whether it's direct, organic, paid, referral, or social traffic. If it's a content site, you want a lot of that traffic to be direct or organic. Hopefully more than 50% of the traffic is direct or organic, which means you're essentially leveraging strong keyword, a strong keyword backbone from which you can acquire customers. And again, Google is your friend. So 
that gives you some indication as to the quality of the site. Um, you also want to know how they're making money. And certain business models are easier to run than other business models. So if you're looking for a good deal, a good deal may be a good deal because of the way it makes money. And so if someone is a good ad salesperson, and that's how that content asset is actually deriving its revenue, then that's going to be dependent on whether you, or at least you can hire someone who is equally as good a salesperson as the prior owner. Or if something is generating revenue from a more sustainable, repeatable source like the Amazon Associates program, which is essentially an affiliate marketing program, whereby any clicks are sent out to Amazon in the event that the user converts, you get paid a commission on that conversion. That's a more repeatable, predictable model, which is less dependent on your own capability. So that would be something you would look for. Um, and then of course, the content. How is the content being derived? And is that something that you are also able to continue on with? Are there existing writers in place? Um, is it generated via AI or is there writers producing it? Um, is it a small number of articles which are generating the vast majority of the traffic? or are you consistently reliant on producing more? Is it professionally produced or is it user-generated content? So what you're trying to understand is when you say what is a good deal and how do you find a good deal, you're actually trying to understand how the asset performs and you need to imagine yourself being able to perform at the same levels. The best deals are the ones where you can imagine running it in exactly the same way as the owner is today. So that first year post-acquisition is what we call stabilising the patient. It's really just a matter of running it to the same level. Only after that do you look to optimise the best deals and where you can imagine yourself running the asset to the same level. Then it's less risky. Um, it's more predictable. It's more mm. repeatable. It's more likely to thrive. And so that's the way I think about it. But, you know, but as I said, it's different for each business model. So if you're looking for a SaaS asset, it's not just about the trailing 12-month revenue and the trailing 12-month expenses as we spoke about in the content landscape. It's about the churn rate. So if you might be picking up customers quickly, but if you're churning them equally as fast, then you're always trying to pick up the, piece, up the pace. You're always trying to pick up the pieces. Whereas if you've got a low-churn SaaS business, you essentially have, again, the predictability of that revenue coming in each month. And so very much is about trying to understand the business model that's a good fit for your skill set. Those are great insights there. Thank you. Thank you, Blake. I want to ask a question on behalf of the entrepreneurs, right? For people who are building their, their platforms, their, their content, their blogs, how, how should they think about this? Especially, you know, when we enter into this generative AI space um, where, you know, we're seeing a lot. I personally, I've, I'm seeing a lot more of this faceless uh, AI bot doing some of the content, right? How should we think about the threat and for people who are building their online businesses, right? What are, what are your advice to, in terms of increasing their, their valuation, uh, people who are looking for exit strategy? And do you only look at cash flow generating assets? And what about probability? Do they need to be profitable? So just depends on the buyer, really. When some buyers are buying for the audience, and some buyers are buying for the revenue, and some buyers are buying for profitability. So someone who's buying for the audience probably owns other assets and they're looking to capitalize on their existing way of making money by throwing in a larger audience. Someone who's buying for revenue probably again already has an existing portfolio and they're looking to acquire that revenue inexpensively to build obviously um, you know, one plus one equals two. So if they already own something hundred thousand dollars they buy something for a hundred thousand dollars then they're doing two hundred thousand dollars in revenue they're a bigger business if they're an individual they're going to be more likely buying for profitability because they're actually there to um, either derive supplementary income or replace their income in which case the profitability is all that matters so it just depends on who the buyer is and some of them i'm a business owner thinking about my online business um, you should always be thinking about the exit whether you want it today, whether you want it in three years, whether you want it in 10 years, you should be thinking about that. And so what that means is you're trying to fast track your pathway to something which is predictable and repeatable. If something's predictable and repeatable, that's very much acquirable. If something is unpredictable, it's tough for buyers to imagine how they can operate it. 
and it's also tough for them to, to value it because of its seasonality or lumpiness or unpredictability. So I'd be thinking therefore about to your point about AI, how can you use technology to automate, programmatize, um, and drive efficiency? And so if you're managing a hundred customer support tickets each month, well there's bots that can do that for you. They might not be able to cover ninety a hundred percent of the the support tickets, but they can probably cover fifty percent. If you've got a hundred support tickets and twenty five of them are how do I change my password, well a bot can certainly handle that. So there is an extreme amount of power in the AI tools and technologies available to us today. And it looks to be that most people aren't taking advantage of those laws. So I'd highly encourage you to do that because it means you can spend more time buying the business and getting them to that predictable repeatable state, in which case you're more likely to be able to derive an exit. Thank you, Blake. Um, so in every episode, I'll ask, uh, I guess, a question that the previous guest has asked. So the, the previous guest that I had on my show here was a breathwork specialist in he was the first certified instructor under Wim Hof. So the question he wanted to ask you, and his name is Brian, Brian Lai, the, the question that he, he, he wanted to ask you is how do you define happiness? Given that you are now a high profile CEO and has built a very successful marketplace for digital assets for the last five years, how, how do you see happiness? It's a really, really tough question. Um, I think happiness is day-to-day -day satisfaction. Um, and the reason I say it's day-to-day -day is because I think uh, long term, it's it's difficult to imagine all that life will throw up at you. And so, what that means is living each day one by one to the absolute fullest. And for me, that means achieving at least one thing every single day. That makes me feel fulfilled at work. It means spending enough time with my wife and daughter, in such that I can get a sense for their joys in life, as well as share my love for them. And it means communicating with the people who I know the best and feel fulfilled by and with, and that could be colleagues because of their smarts and intelligence, or it could be friends because of their humor. And so um, surrounding yourself with those people gives you day-to-day -day satisfaction as much as it does being able to achieve that one thing each day. What a, what a beautiful answer. And a question you want to ask the next guest? That was a really good question. I wish I could have asked that one. Um, <laughs> how do they ensure that they have gotten enough out of each day, week, or year? Oh, oh, I think that's a really tough question. I'll, uh, I'll let the next guest know the question that you want to ask them, and I'll let you know what they, uh, what they say about it. Uh, Blake, again, thank you so much for spending your time with us. and helping us learn a lot more about digital assets and what Flipper does. And I've learned a lot from this conversation, from the four skills that you touched on, how to hunt for a good deal, what's happening in the market, in the era of generative AI, and lots of insights around what entrepreneurs or people who are interested uh, in digital assets should really be focusing on, um, you, know, from a, you know, from an education point of view. So thank you so much for your time today, Blake. Is there anything thanks, else you want to you want to say before we wrap up? No, thanks very much. If you're uh, if you're looking to sell a business, come to Flipper. Awesome. All right, we'll stick a link in the description for the audience. Thanks very much, Aaron. Right. Cheers, Blake. Thank you.